This is Dory Bangs by Bruce Sterling. And the first part of the story is all true. Uh, Bruce, uh, not Bruce Sterling, Sterling, Lester Bangs was uh, a pretty famous rock critic for Rolling Stone and, and other, other magazines back in the early 70s. Uh, that's all true. So it's, it's all true. Everything in this story is true until it says, now for some comforting lies. And then it goes off into a fantasy. Okay, so this is Dory Bangs. True facts, mostly. Lester Bangs was born in California in 1948. He published his first article in 1969. Came in over the transom at Rolling Stone. It was a frenzied review of the MC5's Kick Out the Jams. Without much meaning to, Lester Bangs slowly changed from a Roman Law Guzzling College kid into a professional rock critic. There wasn't much precedent for this job in 1969, so Lester kind of had to make it up as he went along. Kind of smell his way into the role, as it were. But Lester had a fine sense of cultural antennae. For instance, Lester invented the tag punk rock. This is posterity's primary debt to the band's oeuvre. Lester's not as famous now as he used to be because he's been dead for some time. But in the 70s, Lester wrote a million record reviews for Cream and The Village Voice and NME and Who Put the Bump. He liked to crouch over his old manual typewriter and slam out wild beat-influenced copy while the Velvet Underground or Stooges were on the box. This made life a hideous trial for the neighborhood, but in Lester's opinion, the neighborhood pretty much had it coming. A.P.T. le bourgeois, man. Lester was a party animal. It was a professional obligation, actually. Lester was great fun to hang with, because he usually had a jagged speed edge, which made him smart and bold and rude and crazy. Lester was a one-man band, until he got drunk. Nutmeg, Romilar, Belladonna, Crank, those substances Lester could handle. But booze seemed to crack him open. An unexpected black dreck of rage and pain would come dripping out like oil from a broken crank case. Toward the end, Lester had no notion the end was nigh. He'd given up the booze, more or less. Even a single beer often triggered frenzies of self-contempt. Lester was 33 and sick of being groovy. He was restless and the stuff he'd been writing lately no longer meshed with the surroundings that had made him what he was. Lester told his friends he was going to leave New York and go to Mexico and work on a deep, serious novel about deep, serious issues, man. The real thing this time. He was really going to pin it down, get into the guts of Western culture, what it really was, how it really felt. But then, in April of 82, Lester happened to catch the flu. Lester was living alone at the time, his mom, the Jehovah's Witness, having died recently. He had no one to make him chicken soup, and the flu really took him down. Tricky stuff, flu, has a way of getting on top of you. Lester ate some Darvons, but instead of giving him that buzzed-out float it usually did, the pills made him feel foggy and dull and desperate. He was too sick to leave his room, or hassle with doctors or ambulances, so instead he just did more Darvon, and his heart stopped. There was nobody there to do anything about it, so he lay there for a couple of days till a friend showed up and found him. More true facts, pretty much. Dory Sita was born in 1951. She was a cartoonist of the underground variety. Dory wasn't ever famous, certainly not in Lester's league, but then she didn't beat her chest and bend every ear in an effort to make herself a living legend either. She had a lot of friends in San Francisco, anyway. Dory did a comic book once called Lonely Nights, an unusual comic book for those who haven't followed the funnies trade lately, as Lonely Nights was not particularly funny, that she really get a hoot from deeply revealing tales of frustrated personal relationships. Dory also did a lot of work for Weirdo magazine, which emanated from the artistic circle of R. Crumb, he of Keep on Truckin' and Fritz the Cat fame. R. Crumb once said, Comics are words and pictures. You do anything with words and pictures. As a manifesto, it was a typically American declaration, and it was a truth that Dory held to be self-evident. Dory wanted to be a true artist in her own real gone little 80s-esque medium. Comics, or graphic narrative, if you want a snazzier cognomen for it, was a breaking thing. She had to feel her way into it. You can see the struggle in her comics, always relentlessly autobiographical. Dory hanging around in the Café La Bohème trying to trade food stamps for cigarettes. Dory living in drafty warehouses in the shabby hippie section of San Francisco, sketching under the skylight and squabbling with her roommate's boyfriend. Dory trying to scrape up money to have her dog treated for mange. Dory's comics are littered with dead cigarette butts and toppled wine bottles. She was, in a classic nutshell, wild, zany, and self-destructive. 
In 1988, Dory was in a car wreck which cracked her pelvis and collarbone. She was laid up, bored, and in pain. To kill time, she drank and smoked and took painkillers. She caught the flu. She had friends who loved her, but nobody realized how badly off she was. Probably she didn't know it herself. She just went down hard and couldn't get up alone. On February 26, her heart stopped. She was 36. So enough true facts. Now for some comforting lies. As it happens, even while a malignant cloud of flu virus was lying in wait for the warm hospitable lungs of Lester Bangs, the fate, after pose, who, she who weaves the things that are to be, accidentally dropped a stitch. Knit one, pearl two. What the hell does it matter anyway? It's just human lives, right? So Lester, instead of inhaling a, a cloud of invisible contagion from the exhalations of a passing junkie, is almost hit by a yellow cab. This mishap on his way back from the deli shocks Lester out of his dogmatic slumbers. High time, Lester concludes, to get out of this burg and down to sunny old Mexico. He's going to tackle his great American novel, All My Friends Are Hermits. So true. None of Lester's groovy friends go out much anymore. Always ahead of their time, Lester's bohemian cadre are no longer rock and roll animals. They still wear black leather jackets. They still stay up all night. They still hate Ronald Reagan with fantastic virulence, but they never leave home. They pursue an unnamed lifestyle that so says sociologist Faith Popcorn, how can you doubt anyone with a name like Faith Popcorn, who describe years later as cocooning. Lester has eight zillion rock, blues, and jazz albums crammed into his grubby NYC apartment. Books are piled feet high on every available surface. William Burroughs, Hunter Thompson, Celine, Kerouac, dozens of unsold copies of Blondie, Lester's book-length band bio. More albums and singles come in the mail every day. People used to send Lester records in the forlorn hope he would review them. Now it's simply a tradition. Lester has transformed himself into a countercultural info sump. People send him vinyl just because he's Lester Bangs, man. Still jittery from his thrilling brush with death, Lester looks over his lifetime of loot with a surge of sultry and nausea. He resists the urge to raid the fridge for his last desperate can of black spear. Instead, Lester snorts some speed, calls an airline to plan his Mexico getaway. After screaming in confusion at the hopeless, stupid bitch of a receptionist, he gets a ticket to San Francisco, best he can do on short notice. He packs in a frenzy and splits. Next morning finds Lester exhausted and wired and on the wrong side of the continent. He's brought nothing with him but an army duffel bag with his Olympic portable, some typing paper, shirts, assorted vials of dope, and a paperback copy of Moby Dick, which he's always meant to get around to rereading. Lester takes a cab out of the airport. He tells the cabbie to drive nowhere, feeling a vague, compulsive urge to soak up the local vibe. San Francisco reminds him of his Rolling Stone days, back before Wenner fired him for being nasty to rock stars. Fuck Wenner, he thinks. Fuck this city that was almost Avalon for a few months in 67. has been on grease skids to hell ever since. The hilly, half-familiar streets creep and wriggle with memories, avatars, talismans. Decadence, man. A no-kidding death of effect. It all ties in for Lester in a bilious mental stew. Snuff movies, discos, the cold-blooded wine of synthesizers, pet rocks, S&M, Monfuck self-improvement cults, winning through intimidation, every aspect of the invisible war slowly eating the soul of the world. After an hour or so, he stops the cab at random. He needs coffee, white sugar, human beings, maybe a cheese danish. Lester glimpses himself in the cab's window as he turns to pay. A chunky, jobless 33-year-old in a biker jacket, speed-pale, dissipated New York face, Fu Manchu mustache looking pasted on. Running to fat, running for shelter, no excuses, bangs. Lester hands the driver a big tip. Chew on that, pal. You just drove the next Oswald Spengler. Lester staggers into the cafe. It's crowded and sticks of patchouli and clove. He sees two chain-smoking punkettes hanging out at a four-mica table. CBGB's types, but with California suntans. The kind of women, Lester thinks, who sit cross-legged on the floor and won't fuck you but are perfectly willing to describe in detail their highly complex, post-existential gestalt. Tall and skinny and crazy-looking and bad news. Exactly his type, really. Lester sits down at their table and gives them his big rubber grin. Been having fun, Lester says. They look at him like he's crazy, which he is. But he wangles their names out, Dory and Christine. Dory's wearing fishnet stockings, cowboy boots, a strap of second-hand bodice hugger covered with peeling pink feathers. Her long brown hair is streaked blonde. Christine's got a black-knit tack top and a leather skirt and a skull tattoo on her stomach. 
Dory and Christine have never heard of Lester, Lester Bangs. They don't read much. They're artists. They do cartoons, underground comics. Lester's mildly interested. Manifestations of the trash aesthetic always strongly appeal to him. Seems so American. The good America, that is. The righteous, wild America of rootless European refuse, picking up discarded pop junk and making it shine. To make comic books into art. What a hopeless fucking effort. Worse than rock and roll and you don't even get heavy bread for it. Lester says as much to see what they'll do. Christine wanders off for a refill. Dory, who is mildly weirded out by this tubby, red-eyed stranger with his loud come on, gives Lester her tub of barrel brush off, which consists of opening up this Windex clear vision into the vent of hell that is her daily life. Dory lights another camel from the butt of the last, smiles at Lester with her big gappy front teeth, and says brightly, You like dogs, Lester? I have this dog. He has eczema and disgusting open sores all over his body. He smells really bad. I can't get friends to come over because he likes to shove his nose right into their, you know, into their crotch and go snort, snort. I want to scream with wild dog joy in the smoking pit of a charnel house, Lester says. Dory stares at him. Did you make that up? Yeah, Lester says. Where were you when Elvis died? You taking a survey on it, Dory says. No, I just wondered, Lester says. There was talk of having Elvis's corpse dug up and his stomach analyzed for dope, you know. Can you imagine that? I mean, the thrill of sticking your hand and forearm into Elvis's rotted guts and slopping around the stomach lining and liver and kidneys, coming up out of dead Elvis's innards, triumphantly clutching some crumbs off a few, few perkadans and dezoxins and lewds. And then, this is the real kick, Dory. You pop these crumpled up bits of pills into your own mouth and bolt them down. You get high on drugs that not only has Elvis Presley, the king, gotten high on, not the same brand, brand, mind you, but the same pills, all slimy with little bits of his innards. So you've actually gotten to eat the king of rock and roll. Who did you say you were? Dory says. A rock journalist? I thought you were putting me on. Lester Bangs, that's a fucking weird name. Dory and Christine have been up all night dancing to the, to the heroin headbanger vibes of Darby Crash and the Germs. Lester watches through hooded eyes. This Dory is a woman over 30. She's got this wacky airhead routine down smooth, the big shiny fun of the American pop bohemia. Beneath the skin of her attitude, he can sense a bracing, a bracing skeleton of pure des desperation. There's hollow fear and sadness in the marrow of her bones. He's been writing about a topic just like this lately. They talk a while, about the city mostly, about the variant scenes, sparring, but he's interested. Dory yawns with pretended disinterest and gets up to leave. Lester notes that Dory is taller than he is. It doesn't bother him. He gets her phone number. Lester crashes in a holiday inn. Next day, he leaves town. He spends a week in a flop house in Tijuana with his great American novel, which sucks. Despondent and terrified, he writes himself little cheering notes. Burroughs was almost 50 when he wrote Nova Express. Hey, boy, you only 33. Burnt out, washed up, finished, a bit of flotsam. And in that flotsam, your salvation, in that one grain of wood, that one bit of that irrelevance, you could bring yourself to describe it, it's no good. He's fucked. He knows he is, too. He's been reading over his scrapbooks lately, those clippings of yellowing newsprint, thinking, he's all a box, man. You'd think, wow, a groovy youth rebel rock writer, he could talk about anything, can't he? Sex, dope, violence, Mazzola parties with teenage Indonesian groupies, Nancy Reagan publicly fucked by a herd of clapped-out bull walruses, but when you actually read a bunch of Lester Bang's rock reviews in a row, the whole shebang has a delicate, hermetic whiff, like so many 18th century sonnets. It is to dance in chains. It is to see the whole world through a little chromed window of silver-thin shades. Lester Bang's is nothing if not a consummate romantic. He is, after all, a man who really, no kidding, believes that rock and roll could change the world. When he writes something which isn't an impromptu free lesson on what's wrong with Western culture, how it can't survive without grabbing itself by the back brain and turning itself inside out. It feels like he's wasted a day. Now, Lester, fretfully abandoning his typewriter to stalk and kill flophouse roaches, comes to realize that he will have to turn himself inside out, grow or die, grow into something that he has no idea what. He feels beaten. So Lester gets drunk, starts with Takati, works his way up to tequila. He wakes up with a savage hangover. Life seems hideous and utterly meaningless. He abandons himself to senseless impulse, or in alternate terms, 
Lester allows himself to follow the numinous artistic promptings of his soul, holy intuition. He returns to San Francisco and calls Dory Sita. Dory, in the meantime, has learned from friends there is indeed a rock journalist named Lester Bangs, who's actually kind of famous. He once appeared on stage with the Jay Giles band playing his ty- typewriter. He's kind of a big deal, which probably accounts for his being kind of an asshole. On a dare, Dory calls Lester Bangs in New York, gets his answering machine, and recognizes the voice. It was him, all right. Through some cosmic freak, she met Lester Bangs. He tried to pick her up. No dice, though. More lonely night, Dory. Then Lester calls. He's back in town again. Dory's so flustered, she ends up being nicer to him on the phone than she means to be. She goes out with him to rock clubs. Lester never has to pay. He just mutters at people, and they let him in and find him a table. Strangers rush to glad hand Lester, jostle around the table, and pay court. Lester finds the music mostly boring. There's no pretense. He actually is bored. He's heard it all. He sits there, sipping club sodas, and handing out these little chips of woody girl insight into these sleaze-ass Hollywood guys and big-haired coke whores and black spandex, like it was his job. Dora can't believe he's going to go into all this trouble just to jump her bones. It's not like he can't get women, like their own relationship is all that tremendously scintillating. Lester's whole setup is alien, but it is kind of interesting and doesn't demand much. All Dory has to do is dress in her sluttiest goodwill getup and be this chick with Lester. Dory likes being invisible, watching people when they don't know she's looking. She can see in their eyes that Lester's people wonder who the hell is she. Dory finds this really funny, makes sketches of his creepiest acquaintances on cocktail napkins. At night, she puts them in her sketchbooks and writes dialogue balloons. It's all really good material. Lester's also very funny in a way. He's smart, not just hustler clever, but scary, crazy smart, like he's something profound, like he's sometimes profound without knowing it or even wanting it. When he thinks he's being most amusing is when he's actually most depressing. It bothers her that he doesn't drink around her. It's a bad sign. He knows almost nothing about art or drawing. He dresses like a jerk. He dances like a trained bear. And she's fallen in love with him and she knows he's going to break her goddamn heart. Lester has put his novel aside for the moment. Nothing new there. He's been working on it in hopeless spasms for ten years. But now, juggling this affair takes all he's got. Lester is terrified that this amazing woman is going to go to pieces on him. He's seen enough of her work now to recognize that she's possessed of some kind of genuine demented genius. He can smell it. The vibe pours off her like Everglades Swamp Reek. Even in her frowsy house robe and bunny slippers, hair a mess, no makeup, half asleep, he sees something there like Dresden, China, something fragile and precious. The world seems like a maelstrom of jungle hate, sinking into entropy or gearing up for Armageddon, and what the hell can anybody do? How can he be happy with her and not be punished for it? How long can they break the rules before the Nova police show? But nothing horrible happens to them. They just go on living. Then Lester blunders into a virulent cloud of Hollywood money. He's written a stupid and utterly commercial screenplay about the laugh-a-minute fictional antics of a heavy metal band. Without warning, he gets $80,000 for it. He's never had so much money in one piece before. He has, he realizes, with dawning horror, sold out. To mark the occasion, Lester buys some free bass, six grams of crystal meth, rents a big white Cadillac. He fast talks Dory into joining him for a supernaturally cool Kerouac adventure in the savage heart of America. They get in the car laughing like hyenas and take off for parts unknown. Four days later, they're in Kansas City. Lester's lying in the back seat in a jittery Hank Williams half doze, and Dory is driving. They have nothing left to say, so they've been arguing viciously ever since Albuquerque. Dory, white-knuckled, sinus is scorched with crack, loses it behind the wheel. Lester slammed from the back seat and wakes up to find Dory knocked out and drizzling blood from a scalp wound. Caddy's wrapped messily into the back buckled ruins of a sidewalk mailbox. Lester holds the resultant nightmare together for about two hours, which is long enough to flag down help, get Dory into a Kansas City trauma room. He sits there, watching over her, convinced he's lost it, blown it, it's over, she'll hate him forever now. My God, she could have died. As soon as she comes to, he'll have to face her. The thought of this makes something buckle inside him. He flees the hospital in headlong panic. He ends up in a sleazy little rock dive downtown where he jumps onto a table and picks a fight with the bouncer. After he's knocked down for the third time, he gets up screaming for the manager. I was going to ruin that motherfucker. Club's owner shows up, tired and red-faced and sweaty. The owner, whose own tragedy must go mostly unexpressed here, is a fat, white-haired, cigar-chewing third-rater 
who has attempted and failed to model his life on Elvis's Colonel Parker. He hates kids. He hates rock and roll. He hates the aggravation of smart-ass, doped-up hippies screaming threats and pipping off the hard work of businessmen just trying to make a living. He has Lester Hall to his office backstage and tells him all this. Toward the end, the owner's confused, almost plaintive, as he's never seen anyone as utterly, obviously, and desperately fucked up as Lester Bangs, who can still be coherent about it, use phrases like rendered to the factor of machinehood while mopping blood from his punched nose. And Lester, trembling and red-eyed, tells him, Fuck you, Jack. I could run this jerk-off place. I could do everything you do, blind drunk, and make this place a fucking legend in American culture, you bourgeois son of a bitch. Yeah, punk, if you had the money, the owner says. I've got the money. Let's see your papers, you evil cracker bastard. In a few minutes, Lester is the owner to be on a handshake and an earnest check. Next day, he brings Dory Roses from the hospital shop downstairs. He sits next to the bed. They compare bruises. Lester explains to her that he has just blown his fortune. They're now tied down and beaten in the corn-shucking heart of America. There's only one possible action left to complete this situation. Three days later, they are married in Kansas City by a justice of the peace. Needless to say, marriage does not solve any of their problems. It's a minor big deal for a while. It gets mentioned in rock mag gossip columns. They get some telegrams from friends. Dory's mom seems pretty glad about it. They even get a nice note from Julie Burchill, the Marxist Amazon from New Music Express, who's quit the game to write for fashion mags. And her husband, Tony Parsons, the proverbial hip young gun- gunslinger, who now writes weird pot boiler novels about racetrack gangsters. Tony and Julie seem to be making some kind of a go of it, kind of inspirational. For a while, Dory calls herself Dory Sita Bangs, like her good friend, Aline Kaminsky Trum. After a while, she figures, what's the use? Just calls herself Dory Bangs, which sounds plenty weird enough on its own. Lester can't say he's really happy or anything, but he's sure busy. He renames the club Waxy's Travel Lounge, for some reason known only to himself. The club loses money quickly and consistently. After the first month, Lester stops playing Lou Reed's Metal Machine music before sets. That helps attendance some. Waxy's is still a club which books a lot of tiny, weird college circuit acts that Albert Average just doesn't get yet. Pretty soon they're broke again and living on Lester's reviews. They'd be even worse off, except Dory does a series of promo posters for Waxy. They're so amazing that they draw people in, even after they've been burned again and again on weird-ass bands only Lester can listen to. After a couple of years, they're still together, where they have shrieking, crockery-throwing fights, and once, when he's been drinking, Lester wrenches her arm so badly, Dory's truly afraid it's broken. It isn't, luckily. Sure no great kicks being Mrs. Lester Bangs. Dory was always afraid of this. What he does is work. What she does is cute. How many great women artists are there anyway, and what happened to them? They went into patching the wounded ego and picking up the drooped socks of Mr. Wonderful. That's what. No big mystery about it. And besides, she's 36 and still barely scraping a living. She pedals her beat-up bike through the awful Kansas weather. She's as yuppies cruise by with these smarmy grins. Hey, we don't have to invent our lives. Our lives are invented for us. And boy, does that ever save a lot of soul-searching. But still, somehow, they blunder along. They have the occasional good break. Like when Lester turns over the club on Wednesdays to some black kids for disco night. Turns out to be the beginning of a little Kansas City rap scratch scene, which actually makes the club some money. And Polly Rock, a band Lester hates at first, but later champions to global megastardom, cuts a live album in Waxies. And Dory gets a contract to do one of those 20-second animated logos for MTV and really gets into it. It's fun. So she starts doing video animation work for fairly big bucks and even gets a Macintosh 2 from Video Hack Admirer in Silicon Valley. Dory has always loathed, feared, and despised computers, but this thing is different. This is the kind of art that nobody's ever done before. It has to be invented from leftovers, sweat, and thin air. It's wide open and way rad. Lester's novel doesn't get anywhere, but he does write a book called A Reasonable Guide to Horrible Noise, which becomes a hip coffee table cult item with an admiring introduction by a trendy French semi autician Among other things, this book introduces the term chipster, which describes the kind of person who, well, didn't really exist before Lester described them. Once he pointed them out, it was obvious to everybody. They were still not happy. They both had a hard time taking the marital fidelity notion with anything like seriousness. They have a vicious fight once over the who gave who herpes, and Dory splits for six months and goes back to California. When she looks up her old girlfriends and finds the survivors married with children, and her old boyfriends are even seedier and more pathetic than Lester. What the hell? 
It's not happiness, but it's something. She goes back to Lester. He's gratifyingly humble and appreciative for almost six weeks. Waxies does, in fact, become a cultural legend of sorts. They don't pay you for that. Anyway, it's hell to own a bar while attending sessions of Alcoholics Anonymous. So Lester gives in and sells the club. He and Dory buy a house, which turns out to be far more hassle than it's worth, and they go to Paris for a while, where they argue bitterly and squander all their remaining money. When they come back, Lester gets, of all the awful things, an academic gig for Kansas State College. Lester teaches rock and popular culture. In the 70s, there would have been no room for such a hopeless skid row weirdo in a like, serious academic environment. It's the late 90s by now. Lester has outlived the era of outlawhood. Because who are we kidding? Rock and roll is a satellite-driven worldwide information industry, which is worth billions and billions if they don't study major industries and what the hell are the taxpayers funding colleges for. Self-destruction is awfully tiring. After a while, they just give it up. They've lost the energy to flame out, and it hurts too much, so I just less trouble just to live. They eat balanced meals, go to bed early, attend faculty parties, where Lester argues violently about the parking privileges. Just after the turn of the century, Lester finally gets his novel published, which seems quaint and dated now, gets panned and quickly remindered. It would be nice to say that Lester's book was rediscovered years later as a classic of literature, but the truth is, Lester is no novelist. What he is, is a cultural mutant. What he has in the way of insight and energy has been eaten up, subsumed by the beast man. What he thought and said made some kind of difference, nowhere near as big a difference as he dreamed. In the year 2015, Lester dies of a heart attack while sho shoveling snow off his lawn. Dory has him cremated, one of those plasma flash cremators that are all the mode in 21st century undertaking business. It's a nice, respectful, respectful retrospective on Lester in the New York Times Review of Books. The truth is, Lester's pretty much a forgotten man. A colorful footnote for cultural historians who can see the 20th century with the unflattering advantage of hindsight. A year after Lester's death, they demolished the remnants of Waxy's travel la ra lounge to make room for a giant high-rise. Dwyer goes out to see the ruins. As she wanders among the shockingly staid and unromantic rubble, as another of those slips in the fabric of fate, Dwyer is approached by a vision. Thomas Hardy used to call it the imminent will, in China, it might have been the Tao. We late 20th century postmoderns would probably call it something soothingly pseudoscientific like the genetic imperative. Dory, being Dory, recognizes this glowing androgynous figure as the child they never had. Don't worry, Mrs. Bangs, the child tells her. I might have died young of some ghastly disease, grown up to shoot the president and break your heart. Anyhow, you two would have been no prize as parents. Dory can see herself and Lester in this child. There's a definite... Nacreous gleam in its right eye that's Lester's. The sharp, quiet left eye is hers. But behind the eye, where there should be a living, breathing human being, there's nothing. It's kind of a chill, galactic twinkling. And don't feel guilty for outliving him either, the child tells her, because you're going to have what we laughingly call a natural death. It means you're going to die in the company of strangers hooked up to tubes when you're old and helpless. But did it mean anything, Dory says, if you mean, were you immortal artists leaving indelible graffiti in the concrete sidewalk of time? No. You never walked this earth as gods. You were just people. It's better to have a real life than no life, the child shrugs. You weren't all that happy together, but you did suit each other. And if you'd both married other people instead, there would have been four people unhappy. So here's your consolation. You helped each other. So, Dory says, so that's enough just to shelter each other and help each other up. Everything else is gravy. Someday, no matter what, you go down forever. Art can't make you immortal. Art can't change the world. Art can't even heal your soul. All it can do is maybe ease the pain a bit, make you feel more awake. And that's enough. It only matters as much as it matters, which is zilch to an ice-cold interstellar cosmic principle like yours truly. If you try to live by my standards, it will only kill you faster. By your own standards, you did pretty good, really. Well, okay then. After this purportedly earth-shattering mystical encounter, her life simply went right on, day following day, just like always. Dora gave up computer art. It's too hairy trying to keep up with a hotshot, high-tech cutting edge. Kind of undignified when he came right down to it. Better to leave that to hungry kids. She was idle for a while, feeling quiet inside. Finally, she took up watercolors. 
For a while, Dory played the crazy old lady artist and was kind of a mainstay of the Kansas regionalist art scene. Granted, Dory was no Georgia O'Keeffe, but she was working and living, and she touched a few people's lives. Or at least, Dory surely would have touched these people if she'd been there to do it. But of course, she wasn't and didn't. Dory Sita never met Lester Bangs. Two simple, real-life acts of human caring at the proper moment might have saved them both. When those moments came, they had no one, not even each other. So they went down into darkness like skaters breaking through the hard, bright, shiny surface of our true facts world. Today, I made this white paper dream to cover the holes they left.